So, good morning, everyone. It's 9 a.m. on the West Coast. Um, I'm Alex Boot, co-director of the BD2K Center's Coordination Center. So, today we continue our computing overview with what I believe is our fifth talk in this section. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Vivian Benazi of NIH. Uh, Dr. Benazi is the Senior Advisor for Data Science Technologies and the Commons, which is what she'll be talking about shortly. She serves on the BD2K Executive Committee and leads a variety of data science and sustainability efforts through the National Institutes of Health. She holds a PhD in Molecular Pharmacology and Computational Biology from the University of Melbourne and was a Senior Associate at Booz Allen Hamilton, managing several genome and protein bioinformatics projects there. As part of NIH, she, she has served as a Program Director for the National Human Genome Research Institute and was part of the Human Microbiome Project. Uh, where she was responsible for the bioinformatic and computational elements of that effort. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Benazi this morning. She'll be giving us some insights about the relatively new and exciting NIH Commons. So Dr. Benazi, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Commons, but also just give you a few few updates on where we are with that, which is the context of this talk today. So I'm just going to, you can, can everyone see my screen? Is that the answer to that? Yes, Alex, to you at least. Hello? Can you hear me? Alex, can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you. Okay, great. I'm just trying to get my slides to advance. Okay. All right. So the previous slide was just a little bit about myself. Let's keep moving. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about biomedical big data. I don't know what all of the audience's background is, so I'm going to assume something in biomedical areas and some different degrees in terms of data science. And I'm going to try and build up a picture of essentially why we would need something like the commons and how we're going to approach it in NIH. So starting really at its basic level, this is the kind of data that NIH is, is well known for. A lot of it is, um, a lot of it was analog, but it's moving more and more to digital sciences. And I think we see that from some of the examples I'm just showing here. And as we get more towards wearables and collecting that kind of information, we're obviously going towards more and more data collection as well. So I think this slide is something that maybe people have seen before, which is we hear about the four Vs related to big data. I've heard of several different other ones, and that is the volume as in the amount, the velocity, which is the speed of which you need to uh, process this information, and it's coming up very quickly, the variety in terms of the different data types that we have, and then the veracity, which is really the trustworthiness of the data, and its cleanliness. Can you really trust it, and can you use it? These are the ones that I've seen a lot of, and I've seen a few others, but one of the ones that I want to focus on today is also this, which is that I think that data has value. And it's, I think, a signal of the coming digital economy that I think we're all realizing we're in, and that data is really central to that particular digital economy. I think that economy is characterized by using data to gain a business advantage. And I think, yes, institutions, not just commercial entities, are businesses when we come to data. And I think that organizations that are not born digital will be at a disadvantage in that new economy. So I think organizations will be defined by their digital assets in the future. And by digital assets, I mean these in terms of the sciences. That is data, software, workflows, documentations, journal articles, and there's probably others here as well that I could include. But I think these are the ones that most people would, would know about. And I think what's really important here is that a lot of the most successful organizations of the future will be those that can leverage those digital assets and importantly transform them into a digital enterprise. How do we pull all these pieces together is the question we have to ask. We know we have the pieces, but what do we need to do? I think one of the key ones is to make data the central currency of an organization. And it, it's really usable in a digital ecosystem in the context of where we're talking about the commons. So really, the transactions of using data is really what the commons facilitates. And I'm going to go through that in a little more detail now. 
So let's have a look a little bit about the problem with biomedical data. And when I talked about digital assets before, I want to say that includes data. It isn't just data. And I think there are lots of challenges in biomedical data. And that is, um, and they fall in a couple of different categories. There is the journal article, which is still, I think, the end goal of many scientists. And that's fine, but the data, which is, is seen as a means to an end, is really low value. And I think this, the argument I was just making before is that data actually has value, and it's higher than what we're giving it at the moment. Um, the data is not fair, and that is the term that is being used fairly recently. I'm assuming that listeners have heard of this term, but those that don't, I'm implying that it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And there have been a number of papers over the last two years which talk about this. That in fact, if we're going to give data value, it has to have these properties here in order to be able to do something with it. I think there are also limited infrastructures to support fair data. And I think what the Commons is trying to do is going some way towards doing that. So here is just a short um, presentation, which is uh, from the New York uh, Health Sciences Library. Some of you may have seen this. It's quite long. Uh, the original is actually quite long. I've just taken a short abstract from it to sort of identify the problems with the data. And this, real, uh, this little YouTube video really encapsulates the issues with data. I think it's only about a minute and a bit long. So I'm going to play that now. The link uh, to the full video is shown here at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so you can go to YouTube and actually have a look at that. So here it is. Enjoy. Hopefully the audio will play for you. Hi. Hello. My name is Dr. Judy Benign. I'm an oncologist at NYU School of Medicine. Hello, Dr. Judy Benign. I read your article about B cell functions. It was very interesting. I think that I could use the data for my work on pancreatic cancer. I am not an oncologist. I know, but I think I could use the data for my work on pancreatic cancer. Oh. So do you have the data? Everything you need to know is in the article. No. What I need is the data. Will you share your data? I am not sure that will be possible. But your work is in PubMed Central and was funded by NIH. That is true. And it was published in Science, which requires that you share your data. I did publish in Science. Then I am requesting your data. Can I have a copy of your data? Everything you need to know is in the article. No. I am not sure where my data is. But surely you saved your data. I did. I saved it on a USB drive. Where is the USB drive? It is in a box. It is in the box at home. I just moved. But can I use your data? There are many boxes. Well, I forgot to label the boxes. And as you can see, I think this encapsulates a lot of the problems that we're seeing uh, with data. It's a small vignette. I highly recommend watching the entire video. It's in three parts. So what's changing? We know what the problems are, but let's have a look at what's actually changing. I think one of the things I just mentioned before, which is the issue about making data fair, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And I've just shown a clipping here from the Wilkinson paper um, that came out about a year and a half, year or year ago, um, that actually starts addressing this. There have been a couple of additional papers around this area. And I think what it's doing is really uh, explaining what you need to think about when you're dealing with data and the kinds of issues that you need to be considering when you're dealing with data overall. And I think this is having an impact at all sorts of different levels from institutions like NIH, but I know it's also having an impact across different government institutions, both in the United States, certainly in Europe, also Australia and in Asia. And I think what you're going to see is the applications of these to data sets as we move forward. Another key issue that's, I think, changing that's hopefully avoiding what we just saw in that uh, short video is the data sharing policies from funding agencies like NIH, but I think other ag agencies that also deal with data which is making the data shareable, not just in a form as in making data fair, but also having policies saying we want things to be shared, looking at open data, 
and the standards associated with that and the things that go along with uh, grants that are, uh, that are actually paid by NIH and ensuring that that data is made available. But I think we're also seeing a couple of other things and that is that when you store your data that you're moving towards instead of just having it on local repositories uh, or in general archive repositories, we're actually looking at now research data repositories which store data per se. And there are a number of these that have been coming about and I think that's also a change in the way that we're looking at data. Making these available in a fair format but also having them available to the broader community rather than just the USB drive which is what the previous uh, YouTube video sh showed. I think the other thing is metadata. Uh, metadata is really important in describing the data that you have and ensuring that it is, has quality standards around it is really important. There have been many projects at NIH which have used metadata but not particularly well or used community standards and this is critical for the way that you actually want to index this information and search it and make it findable by others and usable by others. Another one which is, is another change that I'm seeing is the use of the unique identifiers, ensuring that we have identifiers for the data per se uh, that are consistent and also to formulated standards and standards are starting to come across this area. So I think where the YouTube video showed a lot of problems, I think here are some of the areas that I think we're starting to see some change which is starting to enable the better use of data and to see value in the system. But I think we're still in the early days of this and I think it's important that it happens from the ground up, from the PhD students all the way up to the leaders of the institutions to embrace these kinds of changes and to enable them within their organizations or even at a small level as graduate students actually do this within their own work. So I think what we're also trying to get at here is that the FAIR principles drive data to become the currency. If you actually can describe it you know what it is, it's interoperable, it's reproducible, it's basically an apples to apples comparison. You can understand what it is that you have. And I think what we also need to look at are policies that promote data sharing via FAIR can really help change that culture. Which is why I think the leveraging of FAIR principles and turning those into guidelines that the community can use within the context of their own data really will help promote this kind of work. So that's great, you make data fair, but then I think what we also need is ecosystems that allow transactions to occur on that fair data. And imp importantly for biomedical data, you want to do this at scale. We all know, particularly from genome studies, but I think also from some of the brain studies where you're looking at not, not just genomic data, but also imaging studies from those things, that the data is large and getting larger. And it's quite cheap to generate the data, but it's a lot of effort on the other end to store it and also to look at harmonization and to deal with all of these fair concepts. So I think what we want to do is to do all of these things to look at the way we handle data in the future. So now I want to talk a little bit about the data commons. Up until now I've just explained the kinds of things that we're seeing. I think much of the community knows about big data but I've tried to sort of lay the groundwork about the sort of pieces around the data, the problems and the things that are changing. So I just mentioned, what you also need to think about is the way a platform works here to support this whole ecosystem. And really the work that's going on in the data commons is really that. It's looking at a platform that fosters the development of a digital ecosystem to support transactions on fair data. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the principles behind the commons as we see it. Um, and that is as I just mentioned, it's a platform that fosters development of a digital ecosystem, but it treats the products of research, whatever they are, as digital assets. And as I mentioned before, these will be the currencies of institutions in the future. We want all of these digital objects to conform to fair principles, as I've just said before. And we want these digital objects to exist in some sort of uh, shared virtual space so that you can find them, deposit, manage, share, reuse, essentially do a work on this object, on these objects and do science. And you want to create a platform because the platforms enable interactions between producers and consumers of those digital assets. And I think there are many biomedical scientists who produce information that want it to be consumed by others. And what we want is some sort of level of exchange to do that. It also gives currencies to the digital assets and the people who develop and support them. One of the big issues is that the papers that are produced can often have PIs 
and that's important to do that, but a lot of the people that do the data scrubbing, the informaticians, some of the software engineers, don't get the kind of currency that they really need when they're actually working on these digital assets. And I think papers are great, but it would also just be very helpful and I think really good to give currency to the digital assets themselves, be they whatever they are. And I think the most common ones right now that people look at are data and software. And if somebody developed those, they get attribution for that. And there is a way to do that that isn't necessarily a paper. And I think we're starting to see elements of that. You see that certainly within GitHub and you see it within data repositories that are just involved in sorting data, particularly from papers. So I mentioned before that the Data Commons is a platform, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about a platform. And it's essentially a platform that fosters that development of the ecosystem. So let's talk a little bit about what that might look like. And we're in the fairly early days of this. So I'm going to take a quote here from a fellow that I've been doing some work with here, which is Sangeet Paul Chowdhury. He's been looking at, he's written a book called Platforms at Scale. This slide has a link to that. I presume these slides will be made public. I'll certainly put them on my slide share afterwards and you'll be able to download them. Um, Sangeet looks at platforms in the digital space and I'll explain those in a little minute. But here he's saying platforms is a plug and play model that allows multiple participants, the producers and consumers to connect to it, to interact with each other and to create value. And what uh, Sangeet has been looking at specifically is all of these platforms that if I just show you this icon, you'll identify pretty much all of them. Uh, a very classic one is Airbnb, right? It's a platform that allows producers and consumers to interact with vacant apartments, uh, houses, um, essentially accommodation with people who need that. And he's been looking at how those platforms are set up to connect producers and consumers and what really uh, allows them to work and what are their business models behind that. So. As I mentioned before, but I think it's worth stating again, that you want interactions between producers and consumers. So somebody who generates biomedical data, and often the tools, but not necessarily just that, wants to be able to share that information with others, either within a consortium or with just others in the future who want to consume it, say if they have a new grant that they want to submit or application they want to submit to NIH. So to understand the Data Commons platform and really how it might work for biomedical sciences, um, I'm going to use what's called a platform stack to help visualize this concept. Uh, Sangeet looks at it in terms of the broader digital community, but I think it's really important for us to look at some of the layers that are really consistent amongst every single one of these platforms that um, he's been talking about, and certainly uh, consistent with the ones I just showed before, and examples were Uber, Airbnb, etc. They're really in three layers. There's a technology infrastructure component, there's a data component, and there's a network marketplace community that consumes this information. In the context of the data commons for NIH, um, this is something I've been working on um, over the last 18 months or so, and really looking at, okay, how do we look at this, if this is a platform to support uh, data at, uh, for NIH data, uh, what's the right way to think about it? And this is something that's just a model of that stack in a diagram. I'll just walk through it just briefly here. So the bottom layer is a technology layer. This is where uh, we have a compute platform. You want to operate on the data in some form. We are going to leverage uh, cloud services at an edge, in part because we see a great deal of researchers, particularly using large data, uh, moving it from repositories to clouds, commercial clouds, and essentially doing some work on it, some form of analysis, and once they've done their analysis, they remove it from the cloud and they have their results. But they generally don't leave their data sets up there because uh, storage costs are too high. And certainly moving multiple petabytes of data would incur a huge number of costs for them. So we're looking at what's the right way to use the cloud platform to facilitate the researchers at NIH. In saying that, we're also dealing with supercompute facilities. They're primarily funded through uh, DOE, not NIH, but we're working with them to figure out how we can collaborate. But essentially, the bottom line is you've got a technology platform here, which is cloud or supercompute. The next layer is data, and we have a collection of data. Some of those are from large generated data sets, which are funded by NIH. These are often, um, I call them reference data sets. They're in the certainly terabyte to petabyte range, generated by NIH, usually under consortiums and with the intent to share. And just some of the examples I can think of there are the ENCODE data sets. Uh, which are used um, by the community and also the 
um, GTEx data sets are some example of ones that I've been dealing with. These are large hundreds of terabyte petabyte data sets which people want to consume but they can't do that either locally in their own uh, systems or at the repositories because they simply don't have the compute resources to it. But we also have user-defined data in the sense that people have smaller data sets that they actually want to bring to these large data sets perhaps and actually do some sort of analysis. But the bottom layer is that you've got a whole bunch of data which needs to be computed against. And then the top layer here is really saying that if you have a platform with data, you want to be able to do various things to it. And the most common thing that people see is you want to do some sort of analysis uh, on it, scientific analysis. But to do that in these environments, you also need to have a collection of services to enable you to do that. First of all, you need to find this information, so you need some form of indexing. This is where the metadata becomes really important. But you also need APIs that can access the data, and you also want, particularly if you're using cloud containers, a uh, common form of that would be, say, um, Docker containers. So there are a series of services that enable you to use this data in these particular environments, and we need to pay attention to those as well as the scientific analysis tools that you want to use to actually operate on the data. And on the top of all of that, I think what you want is to have some form of interface which uh, allows you to access a collection of these data sets appropriately and some sort of really marketplace to allow those interactions to drive innovation. Um, the other thing you need to do is obviously have digital object compliance, and this touches on the FAIR principles. So essentially, this stack is three parts, um, some form of compute, a whole lot of data from NIH in some form, or biomedical data in general, and a collections of services and tools that allow you to operate on that data, on FAIR data. If you want more information, there's a link at the bottom of the slide that takes you to far more detailed information at the Commons if you want to read about it. A couple of other things I just want to point out. Um, again, looking at platforms in general, if you look at this in the context of some of the way IT sees it, the bottom layer is really the infrastructure as a service. And then the layers around the, the data and the tools around those, the services and the, and the analytics, is really platforms or software as a service. And I think this is where we're starting to see um, some play, certainly in the market. We're seeing a lot of SaaS providers out there, certainly in biomedical sciences, but you're certainly seeing it in other areas as well. And I'll show a couple of examples of those in a minute. But I think we're also going to see uh, a drive to data as a service in the long term, because I think really data is going to be the currency to this. And how that looks like, I think we're, we're just starting to understand those pieces. Just a moment about digital object compliance. This is really about making things fair. I won't go through this in a lot of detail. Um, I'll just say that uh, there are key aspects of this that we need. Would you need digital object identifiers? that resolve to original sources that's machine readable and you have a minimal set of metadata and you have clear access rules and entry and indices. If you do this, I think what that does is it allows us to uh, move towards uh, fairness, essentially. This slide was done a little while ago. So our initial phase was looking at this and what we've actually started to do is develop working groups within BD2K but also reaching out more broadly across the community to look at developing fair guidelines. What does that really mean to be fair? And we, uh, that group, I think, started last year, and it's just starting to gather steam. And the purpose is to develop guidelines to share those with the community. All right, here's some examples of just platforms. I'm not endorsing any of these. I'm just simply saying, here are examples. This is a SaaS application that a lot of people who deal with genomics will probably know, which is DNA Nexus, um, that allows you essentially to develop, to use pipelines uh, and various tools, uh, essentially over clouds and they have a lot of genomic data, and the purpose of this company, I think, is to enable scientists to really use data at scale, and it's very much a platform that follows uh, some of the principles I just showed for the commons. Uh, another one is in this example is Seven Bridges as well. I think they fall into the same category of a SaaS, and as you'll notice, many of them call themselves platforms for good reasons, I believe. So. I think what you'll find is that the data commons, therefore, drives this digital ecosystem. It's the pieces behind it that enable you to do work with that data. And so now I want to do is, is switch a little bit to talk about some data commons pilots and talk about uh, some of the work that we're doing at NIH. I'm not covering all of it. I'm just covering some examples of that that sort of uh, enable you to hopefully understand a little bit more about the concept of the platform and commons. So one of the ones we're working on is really looking at the co-location of large and or highly utilized NIH-funded data with storage and compute infrastructure 
i.e. a cloud. And they're commonly used tools for the analysis and the sharing of those digital objects. The purpose is to create an interoperable resource for the research community. Another key factor is the purpose of the cloud isn't just necessarily because the data is large. It's also a place for collaboration and sharing of digital objects. And I think this is one of the key things that we've also found that researchers often do their analysis. They use, say, a cloud simply because they have large data sets, but they often want to share or collaborate as projects are going on. And collaborators and investigators are located geographically in different places across the United States or across the world. So these environments allow them to do these kinds of collaborations much more easily and look at the output of the results, collaborate together. Just want to point out that the commons that I'm talking about in the platform, there are other commonses developing out there, and I just want to point out a couple of these. Uh, the most, probably one of the best known ones is the genomic data commons from NCI at NIH, which is looking at much of the TCGA data uh, loaded up into that system that made available exactly the same way I've been talking about in the general commons concept. But um, certainly in the last year or so, we've also seen the emergence of other ones. So the Fred Hutch um, Cancer Center over in Seattle also is developing the Hutch Data Commonwealth. And the New York Genome Center under Toby Bloom has been developing also uh, New York Genome Center commons. There's also been work done at NIH, at NAID, uh, the Allergy and Infectious Diseases Institute, developing uh, uh, essentially a microbiome platform as well for analysis. So what we're seeing is a collection of commons is happening. The structure of them is very similar to what I just described before as the platform stack. They're all using the basic premise, but the data is somewhat different depending on what the particular data sets they are. But I think it's important to see that they all have fundamentally the same principles and they're all starting to come together. And one of the other things is, how do we connect to them? And I'll get to that in a minute. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the pilot, but I just want to uh, emphasize that this is just an example. The data sets I'm going to show here are not the ones we're going to use. They're just examples of the kinds of things that we have. So it's just a draft. Um, but we are actually working on the principles behind this. And in sometime early this year, in the first quarter, we'll be able to announce some of the work that we're actually doing in this area and some of the specifics around it. So I'm going to take the platform and just give an example around some of this. So I think what we've got here is we have uh, a platform, so we have a collection of different clouds that we can use. I think it's important to look at a variety of different clouds, not just one, in part because we obviously want to avoid some level of vendor lock-in, but I think it also is helpful for supporting innovation and competition amongst them. And each one of the systems is different. They do offer slightly different services. That's potentially a problem and also an opportunity. So I think we're looking at a collection of those. Which ones we choose is going to be dependent upon some of the things that we do based on our use cases. The other thing we're doing there is looking at, uh, if I'm taking this platform, we're saying we, we take a collection of data so here are just some examples of data sets which are supported by NIH. I'm not saying that these would be the ultimate ones we use, but essentially what you're creating is a, a collection of data. Um, they're different types. They don't necessarily interop with each other, but essentially you're creating a pool of data that people could potentially query individually or across, and I think that's pretty important. And from that is going to come the need to potentially harmonize or not and that's a question that we need to look at. But I think a pool of data would actually be quite useful to consider. So if we take that uh, a little bit further, we could layer, layer on top of that a series of analytics and services. And these are just examples of some of those. Some of those are commercial, some of them are not commercial. Some of them are tools, some of them are tool systems, some of the platforms as a service. And the Global Alliance is obviously looking at some standard APIs for querying the data. So there's a collection of things that already exist out there that could essentially layer over the top of this that could leverage the data in a variety of different forms and provide access to the rest of the biomedical community. Um, the other thing that I think you want to look at is you need to think obviously about the indexing and there's work being done inside BD2K with BioCaddy, uh, which is an indexing system, and Bioschemas, which um, has been discussed with Elixir, which is the group in Europe, looking at schema.org and its applications to biomedical sciences. And I know Biocaddy has been heavily involved in looking at those as well and incorporating a lot of that 
work with in DataMed. But the key point I'm trying to make here is that you need some form of indexing. I'm pointing out these ones here just as examples, um, in part because we're having a BD2K lecture and we are planning to leverage the work that BioCaddy has. But it's really critical that you actually consider the indexing of that. Otherwise, what you have is a whole lot of data and a whole lot of tools that are not necessarily easily findable. And I think that's really important to actually have here and call out in the system. I think um, another aspect here is how we would leverage this potentially at NIH. And I think a real key factor there is the, the things that we can actually do is if we make this data available, these large data sets available in the cloud, and we can layer on these tools, I think there are multiple uh, ways that NIH can foster the innovation of further development in this area. The tools I've laid out here in this around the analytics and services are currently tools that have been developed, but I think we want to foster more of that. And I've just given some examples here of uh, R01s or a bread and butter grant from NIH, but there are other ways to do this. Essentially, there are ways to get grants at NIH to foster innovation over the use of this particular data, and I think we definitely want to do that. But I think what we also want to look at is consider looking challenges and prizes. Why? Because I think it could be really interesting to sort of ask questions across some of this data, assuming the consents allow us to do that, uh, to really kind of think about new ways that you can actually intersect and ask questions across that data to enable discovery in a different way. You can do that, I think, from a couple of different angles. One from a biomedical one, where you can ask an interesting biomedical question across these biomedical data sets uh, to improve the outcome of a biomarker, some sort of new discovery, uh, better understanding of a disease. All of those are relevant. But I think what is also relevant is the services and tools that are needed to do that at a faster and more accurate rate. So how well can you predict a biomarker? What's the best way you can actually do that? What are the tools that you need to do that? What's the statistics you need to do that? Those are some of the aspects I think here that some of these challenges and prizes could also address that I think could yield to some pretty interesting ways that we could leverage this particular data. I think the other thing I want to point out is that um, over the top of this whole thing, you want to have this marketplace, which is, I'm using the term app store because that's where people really have their best understanding of how it works when you use an app and it works over the top of data or uh, within your system. But I think really I'm going towards the concept of a marketplace. How do we actually have a collection of tools, systems, data that you can easily find and create a marketplace for the way that you operate over particular data sets or particular tools. What's the right way to think about that? Um, rather than a single uh, way to view a data through one set of tools alone. I think that's pretty critical. Another aspect to consider about here is what I call the authorization authentication layer. And that is uh, the, a lot of this data was likely to have uh, human subjects issues. So some well, not, but some does. So for example, human microbiome data does not, but many of the other data sets do. So we obviously need to think of the right way to handle that uh, from an AH. And much of the data that's uh, human-based is stored at dbGaP at NCBI. So there's a critical discussion there to happen about how do you set up that authorization authentication layer that allows you to get access to that data in the appropriate way. And we've been having conversations around that within NIH about how that might actually occur. But that's pretty critical so that you can ensure that only the people that are permitted to use the data can actually access that. Another thing that I want to point out here is that this isn't the only commons. What we're looking at here is NIH funded data. But as I pointed out before, there's a collection of different um, commonses that are being developed. And I think what's really important there is that we, we start talking with them now, not at the end, otherwise we create cylinders of excellence. And that's not what we want. So I've certainly had conversations with all of the folks that I pointed out before, and there are more and more folks thinking about this. And we've started some discussions around what's the right way for these pieces to interact and intersect? And where, do, where are they separate? And they need to be separate. Um, so obviously one of the most uh, obvious ones is to look at it through an API access point between these commonses and looking at how we can run services between them. It's complicated, especially when you deal with human subjects data. But I think the conversation is the important point here, that we don't want to simply look at um, providing data and creating innovation on top of it from NIH and not connecting to what other folks are already doing 
in their other commonses. So I have some considerations I want to just talk through now, and that is metrics. What I'm describing here is essentially a platform to support biomedical data that uses cloud data and services. But understanding how and you account for all of the data usage is really important because there will be, we need to understand how it's being used and why. There's also a cost, particularly for these large data sets. Uh, cloud storage is not cheap for the large data sets, particularly if you want to put them in more than one cloud. In saying that, many of the commercial providers are very interested in working with us because they see the value of a platform and an ecosystem that is more than just data storage. So we are you know, in obviously lots of deep conversations with them about the right way to interact. There's also a pay-for-use cloud compute. Um, there is a project which has been developed in NIH called the NIH Credits Model, and I'm not going to speak about that today. Um, but it's really looking at how do you pay for those services directly and how does NIH really understand what people are paying for. For example, when you're using cloud services, a lot of the time you get free uh, credits from the cloud providers per se, which is great. But if you probably tried to include everything that you used on the cloud in your NIH grant, it'd probably be very expensive and it'd take a fairly large chunk out of your grant. There are also other issues that we need to deal with, which is the indirect costs for cloud. When you submit a grant to NIH, there are indirect costs which are associated with the research institution. And I think what we need to look at is the way that these things obviously interact and what's the right way to pay for these and also to deal with the institutions. And now let's be clear, the commercial clouds are useful in the sense that they have scale, but there are many groups out there that have already developed uh, private or institutional based clouds. And there's good reason for doing that. Cost is one. Uh, privacy of data, there's been a lot of concern if you put this on commercial clouds, what's the right way of handling that? Um, I think we're still in the midst of determining those things. And so I think we will see situations where hybrid clouds really are important and necessary and we need to look at what's the right mix between those. And that's pretty uh, a very important thing to look at. We have to look at managing open versus controlled access data. The controlled access data is obviously related to human and we've got to look at what's the right way to manage that. I mentioned that before that the authorization uh, potentially through a single sign-on is the way to do that, but is that really a dream or a nightmare? Because it's, from what we've seen, it's really a very complicated set of things to do. And there may be reasons where a single sign-on is good, but there may be situations where that's not possible. So we need to sort of test all of that and figure out what's the right way to approach it. It's important to point out that we need to look at the difference between archiving versus working and version copies of the data. Um, NIH requires that we keep all our data, certainly the, uh, we archive it. That's where uh, very large archives like NH NCBI are very important and EBI over in Europe. Um, but if we put working copies of the data onto the cloud, they are not archives and we need to know that that's what we're actually doing and why. Another one is if we do move copies of large data sets to the cloud, obviously versioning is going to be pretty important. So how do we handle that? That leads to uh, all sorts of issues around syncing, and I think whatever we do in testing this, we need to figure that out. Um, another one which I mentioned before is interoperability with other commonses. Many of them are going to be based on clouds. The ones I mentioned to you before are going to be based on clouds. And it would be important to ensure that we don't have these cylinders of excellence, that we actually have interoperability between these, these clouds. We also have standards around metadata, UIDs, and the APIs. And the key, I think, here is to reuse what we've already uh, available to us in the community. There is work being done, certainly within BD2K, around metadata templates by Mark Neeson's group at um, CEDA. There's a lot of work being done by various groups with UIDs, and there's the Global Alliance, which has been looking at uh, open standard APIs. There's also work being done uh, within some commons, um, smaller efforts looking at open standard APIs that incorporate metadata and that are smart and actually know they can find different APIs and locate them uh, so that we have a better understanding of what's available to us. But this is critically an important area that we need to have further development in. Discoverability touches on the indexing issue. I mentioned BioCaddy before, but we need to look at 
BiCAD is one place to start and it's a really good place to have uh, to use. But there are other ways to do that and we need to, and the field is changing, so we need to figure out what's the right way to support that kind of work. And particularly if we're going to have uh, data and digital objects of various sorts across different clouds, that's going to be an interesting uh, problem to try and solve as well. Regarding interfaces, I think that's really pretty critical because you've got users with different needs and different capabilities. Certainly in the early versions of what we're trying to do here will um, probably be most usable by those that have a whole lot of bioinformatics capabilities already and understanding. But we understand very clearly that biomedical researchers don't necessarily have the capacity all the time to have bioinformaticians in their group. And so we need to be able to have interfaces that are available to biologists that don't have those capabilities, but definitely want to be able to use the data. So that's something we're really being very mindful of in all of these pieces. Consent. This is a really important piece. So we're getting onto some policy pieces here. Reconsenting of the data may be necessary, and that also could be very complex, particularly if you're trying to traverse across two different data sets that weren't consented to be using for uh, the purpose of using them to mine across two data sets. So we have to be very mindful of those uh, consents in the first place. And so engaging with the right folks to talk about that is really important. We've certainly been doing that at NIH. There are policies that need to be uh, also considered in such a, an endeavor. And that is um, the data sharing policies that are useful and effective to support this kind of open science. Uh, we have some already at NIH, but I certainly think we need a further focus on this. And there are certainly efforts underway uh, at NIH to do this. And I think we need more effort in this area, and I think NIH understands that. I think we also need to keep pace with the use of technology. Uh, and here the example I'd give you is the example of dbGaP data in the cloud. This was uh, a couple of years ago, the policy did, precluded the use of dbGaP data in the cloud. This is a big problem for researchers since they wanted to use that data in the cloud because they had, it was large and they also had large data that they wanted to compare it against. But our policies precluded the use of that. And so a group of us, including myself, uh, helped change some of the policies around that to enable the use of dbGaP data in the cloud. So sometimes what happens is technology is further ahead than the policies, and we need to do a, a good job of making sure that these two things are aligned. And again, it means that we talk, in the case of NIH, the Office of Science Policy, and work with those uh, people to ensure that they understand what we're trying to do and vice versa, so we can keep up to, to speed with the changes in technologies. I think incentives are incredibly important here for the shareability of FAIR data as part of the grant review criteria of NIH. And by that I mean, when you submit a, an application to NIH, you obviously list all of your papers, but it would be really good if people could also cite their data and software and any of the other data assets, the digital assets that you have, in a way that's meaningful and consistent. So I think we don't have a, uh, an incentives in there right now, but I think we're really looking at the fact that if data becomes currency and fair data becomes currency, what's the right way to include that in the review system when you're putting in applications to NIH? We also need to look at governance, which is how do we do this? How do we actually govern the overall way that we handle uh, a commons? I think what's critical here is to have community involvement in this governance model that isn't just generated by NIH. If this is really going to be an open, a platform for open science and an ecosystem to be able to use data at scale and to share it, then I think getting an understanding from community involvement is, is really important. And I think a, a key one here, the last one I've got here on my slides is sustainability. We all know that grants have a cycle at NIH and then they end. So what's the long-term support for this? If we do move data, for example, in the cloud for some of these large data sets, how do we sustain that in the longer term? What's the right business model to do that? And what's the right way to attempt to do that? I think these are all questions that we're, we're having in terms of what we are trying to think about how we approach the commons. So I think I've got just to my last slide here, which is the acknowledgements. And there's a lot of people that have been involved in this. And I, you, most there'll be some folks who recognize the names here. But my point I want to make out is that there's a lot of work happening across NIH that isn't just within one institute, it's across many institutes and in places that are unusual, so to speak, and, and sometimes we do bio work. And that is 
CIT, the Centre for Information Technology, and Andrew Norris's group, who's also the CIO of NIH, which is all the pure computing side has been working heavily with us. Also, Common Fund, who's very interested in this kind of work, has been working with us. Uh, I've listed also the Clinical Centre is working with us, the NIH Clinical Centre, to look at some of their data and also the Office of Science Policy. So it's a collection of folks across NIH, but I'd also like to just have a shout out to research and industry. We have spent a lot of time working with uh, industry, primarily cloud providers, but also these SaaS providers, and also other folks in the community developing commonses. And they've been providing really good and helpful input into the way we're thinking about the commons. So it's really a unified effort across NIH in these discussions in places, not just across certain institutes, and centers, but in places that wouldn't normally be involved in this. So it's really touching on the issue that data is really the currency of the way we have to go forward. So I'm just going to end by just saying thank you for your time. I hope that this has helped you understand a little bit about the path that we took to the data commons, that we have some idea of some pilots we want to do for these large data sets. And in the coming months, we'll be able to explain a lot more detail around what that would be. But essentially what NIH would like to do is to enable the use and access to NIH data sets to the community. And the innovation we hope will come from the community on how you will use those data and how you will actually develop tools, systems, services, platforms, etc. over the top of it. The data sets are large and they cost. I think this is where NIH really needs to play in the game. And we need to help the community get access to that data so that we can innovate both in the data science realm as well as the biomedical realm so that we can actually foster new discoveries. All right, I think that's where I'm going to stop right now and I think we're going to take some questions. Is that right? It is. Thank you, Vivian, for this great overview and for, for giving us an update on, on what's going on with the NIH data comments. So we actually got quite a few questions for you. Um, I'll, I'll just go through some of them. We'll start with this first one, which sort of has to do with, with the bees that are always associated with, with big data. And this is actually touching on the veracity component. Um, and the question is really, given that we're moving towards these, these sort of open data repositories and, and public access to this information, and obviously sharing the information as well and these people being able to put their own data into it, how do, you, how do you know that you can trust the data? How do we actually get to veracity of data? Right, and I think that comes down to some of the FAIR guidelines and making sure that we know that when people apply them, what's the right way that we can, I don't want to use the term policing, but we need to know that we can do that. And that's a complex issue. Um, I think if we can agree to a set of guidelines of what fairness is, and then we can empower ourselves to use those guidelines, I think that's important. Um, I think another thing that we need to consider is that as people start using them, if more transactions happen on quality fair data, right, if they meet the guidelines, then the incentives kick into play, right? So if more people are using the data and it's in fair format and it's compliant, and you can quote it, say, for example, in an application for NIH, that's a good thing. So there are ways to do that where it's actually driven in part by policing or policy making and some of it is I think pushed by the community where if we agree to a standard uh, it makes the transactions in the systems uh, stronger and the data more usable and more quotable. So I think it comes from a combination of two different things um, and I think it also comes from the fact that we don't yet know how to do all of that but knowing the fact that the data can be dirty and not quality I think is really important too. So I think it allows for a little bit of wiggle room to say I don't think we know yet the entirety of the system. Okay, I mean, it, it, definitely it is, it is an open question, is how do, how do we look at that? Um, so following up on that sort of question, and, and, and it is another one from, from uh, regarding the culture of, of data sharing, and, and what is your perception of where the community is at, the, at in terms of of this new culture of data sharing? Or do you feel that, that there's a broad acceptance or a growing acceptance? What, what proportion of scientists and, and um, researchers do you feel sort of are embracing the data sharing and, and participating in it versus those that are basically going to have to be um, 
mandated to, to do the data sharing. Well, this will be my entire opinion, but I can try and address it from a couple of different ranges. Uh, my own personal view is that the participants come from a couple of different regions. I certainly notice it with the younger generation. So the postdocs and the grad students, the openness, their, their approach, they come from open. So their mindset is open, so they tend to share. Um, I think as you go up the, um, the seniority stack, so to speak, uh, some of the PIs who are there now who come from an older generation don't have that kind of mindset, so that creates some issues. But that's not true of all of them. Um, I think some certainly see the value of it, but the mentality, I think, has been changing in the current generations and the ones that are coming through now. So that's one of the things that I see. And so as the grad students are going through the system and becoming professors within departments, they'll bring that culture with them. It'll take time. But I think we're going to see that. And also, I think we've got some perhaps enlightened souls who are pretty senior in their organizations who are also beacons of trying to push this through. And I think there are plenty of examples that we see. So the combination of those, I think, are what I see changing. Um, I think the funding institutions play a crucial role in this. And that is that the funding institutions also have to provide incentives. So as I mentioned during my talk, you need to think about, or we at NIH need to think about the way that this enters the review system. So if there is an incentive for a digital asset that has either primarily data or software is where the talk is right now, that has, for example, a DOI associated with it, that that can actually be listed as something very important in your grant application. And that that has value and weight within the way that NIH sees it when it does a review. It's not just about your paper, it's all about the other things that have occurred as well. And there it touches on the fact of what you just mentioned before, which is, well, if I've got a bunch of these things and I have DOIs, how do I know that the quality of that data is high or not just a bunch of data that is meaningless? So what are the bars there? And I think the application there is, how do we do that? And I don't think we know yet. Uh, and we have to look at it, but I think it's really important that NIH think about the way that they set up incentives for that. And they also have policies in place, which are, the, I guess, the, the stick part of the carrot and the stick, where there is some, some level of ensuring that the community follows some rules. But I think it would be wrong for NIH to simply use the stick all the time. It would be good to have both of those in play, in part because that's the nature of the way systems work, and uh, not all humans play fair. So I think it would be really good to see if we could have a combination of those. Um, that's just sort of my broad general view of what I'm seeing with the culture change. I'm certainly seeing it changing more and more. Every year I see changes, and that's, I think, a good thing towards open. I, think I would agree with you on that. I think there is a, a, a culture change that is happening. Um, it's not happening overnight, but it is slowly percolating up um, and, and becoming more common. Um, another question, um, and this is going to some of the comment or some of the remarks you made regarding uh, BioCaddy and and other um, sort of efforts. Uh, the question revolves around researchers being able to find the most appropriate resources for their needs, and I would assume that that is both with respect to data and the tools and software. Um, could you comment further on other uh, sort of works that BioCaddy or other groups that you're aware of are, are uh, doing to sort of help researchers in this regard? Sure. So I think this is a wide open field. So I think BioCaddy has been doing a lot of work in this area to try and find ways of indexing resources, and I think we're in the early days of that. I'm not going to go into the details of BioCaddy here, in part because uh, I know it to a certain degree, but I think the question is more relevant broadly. Um, I think there's a lot of efforts happening both in industry as well as in research. I've certainly seen it within BD2K that there are different slants on the way that you might want to look at discoverability. Um, it partly depends on what you want to find and how you want to find it. Uh, some things are more discoverable than others because of their metadata. Sometimes the different kind of objects, sometimes you want to find software, sometimes you don't. Um, so there are multiple research and commercial efforts underway. And I think what we need to do is to sort of do some bake-offs to see how do they work against some of the data and tools that we have. Um, how does that work? Um, and I think we're just starting to begin that whole process. 
Uh, I'll give you an example of some of the work I've done with um, Zenodo over at uh, CERN in, in Europe. They're looking at how that they, uh, both repository but also access points for data and uh, tools. How can they search for that? So what's the right way to do that? And then once you do find it, how do you connect it with a service? How do you f do something with it once you've actually found it? Um, I think there's that. And then an obvious one, of course, is you know Google's really good at this kind of stuff. And a lot of their work around schema.org, which is now being incorporated in bioschema.org, I think is another effort to look at how do you leverage ways that methodologies related to discoverability can be used uh, in more appropriate ways for biomedicine. So for example, I know that BioCaddy has been moving towards incorporating a lot of that work within its own data med uh, component. So I think it's a wide open field and it's both got industry as well as uh, researchers across the world looking at this. And I think we're at the stage where we really need to start probing into what are the different resources that are available? How do they do it differently? And is it does it impact what you're searching for? If a different, is it, does it matter which type of digital asset you're searching for? I think that's currently where we've been thinking at NIH. And I think the work that we've seen from BioCaddy has been helping us better understand the way that the community's thinking about it. And as BioCaddy has been looking at indexing various data sets, uh, we're sort of seeing the outcome of those are saying, well, that one worked and this one didn't work so well. So that helps us feed back into the system to say, what we need to actually do. It's a pretty general answer, but I think that's just generally where we're at at the moment. Fair enough. Um, I think that, that there are obviously lots of BD2K specific projects that are also looking at indexing uh, from different uh, perspectives. I know that there's one certainly at UCLA and uh, yep. there are others throughout the different centers of excellence. So, um, and, and I think the good thing is that they're all coming together under one umbrella. Um, so actually there was a question that, that was posed, which is, is talking about the FAIR framework um, and uh, the uh, working groups around that. I, I think I can answer that for you. In this particular case, someone asked, um, how do you go about sort of finding out more about FAIR and, and joining the working group? Uh, there is a Commons framework working groups um, uh, uh, that, that actually addresses FAIR and, and other aspects. And I, We'll make that information available more broadly uh, to the community um, after, after this talk if, if individuals are interested in finding out more about FAIR and the various working groups that uh, Vivian has mentioned. Yeah, um, and I would add, Alex, there that um, Valentina Di Francesco over at NHGRI is the contact person for this um, from the NIH perspective, too. Yes, yes. Um, so one last question before we go. And this has to do, again, with, with sort of the platform and the idea of collaboration. Do you envision any types of collaborative tools to support active collaboration or being sort of more proactive in forging the collaborations within um, the cloud, or not within the cloud, within the commons? Um, so things like being able to communicate, find researchers. Um, yes. So, I, yes, I do. And I think that layer is often not seen by, often by an age. But for example, Figshare, right, that does a lot of these connections, Orchid, um, there are groups out there that have pieces of information that would be really useful to connect within this environment, not just the data. Um, there are also people that are developing collaborative tools for collaboration uh, that allow connections data to tools through services, but also ways to do other things, uh, like linking, uh, linking to scholarly research and scholarly papers, journals, publications, etc. And there are several groups looking at that and have actually developed some platforms in this area. And I think we need to look at what that will be because one, the way that they're developing those, those collaborative platforms, so to speak, are a lot easier for biologists to use. They don't, there's a lower learning curve and the cloud to some extent, if it's being used, is hidden in the background. But it's still being used, but it's a whole lot easier for the people uh, to connect to it. If you think about it, like for example, I gave the example of Airbnb, you don't you can see it immediately. You just see the picture of what you want and you can connect to it. All the pieces that happen underneath behind it, the data, the cloud, all the rest of it is invisible to you. But it means that anyone can use that platform. And I think that's where the collaboration pieces fit into play with some of these tools. They're going to enable more and more people to use these environments 
and it's going to enable them to do science faster and at scale with, that, with lower levels of computing capability. And that's fine because many biologists don't have that. What we have to do is we're right at the start of figuring out if this is what we're looking at as the ecosystem, what do we need to test? And there's a lot of technology we need to test before we can get to the place where it becomes smooth transactions in that environment. Hope that helps. That's great. So thank you again, Vivian. I know it's 10 o'clock, at least on the West Coast. Um, thank you for your time and, and, and this presentation. We've had a lot of great questions and discussion. And of course, the, the insights you provided were wonderful. Sure. I'm happy to take questions offline. I think my, my desktop still has my email address. Um, I'm happy to take private questions about this. You can find me in different places. I'm also going to put this uh, presentation up on SlideShare after this meeting in the spirit of open science, just making sure everything's open. Great. Thank you again. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day.